In this video, I'm going to talk about the different political groups in the European Parliament, which national parties are members of which groups and how they all got on in last week's European elections. I'll also talk about the Spitzen candidate process for the President of the European Commission and how that's going. I'll go through each group in more detail in a moment, but first of all, to give a broad overview of the eight groups, starting on the left of the political spectrum and moving right, we have the GUE stroke NGL. GUE stands for United European Left in French, NGL stands for Nordic Green Left. These parties are mostly democratic socialists. There's a strong anti-capitalist sentiment in this group. A lot of these parties are former or current communist parties. A lot of them use the word left in their name. Next, we have Greens EFA. There are three different elements in this group. You have the Green parties, you have a number of regional separatist parties, particularly from Spain and from the UK. Plaid Cymru and the SNP are part of this group. EFA stands for the European Freedom Alliance. The third element in this group are the European pirate parties. The pirate parties are all for free and open internet and protection of privacy. Next we have SND. They are the mainstream centre-left. A lot of these parties have the words social democrat in their name. So these parties are for social democracy. Social democracy is a system where Capitalism remains, democracy remains, but there's major state intervention in the economy in terms of nationalizing assets and industries. This contrasts with democratic socialism, which does away with capitalism, but retains democracy. Next, we have ALDNR. These parties are mostly liberal. They're not exactly the same as centrism. Liberalism and centrism aren't the same thing, but ALDI certainly belong in the middle between S&D and EPP. Liberal parties are mostly centre-right in terms of the economy and centre-left when it comes to social issues. They typically have a more middle-class feel to them than the centre-left social democrat parties. The EPP, this is the group of Europe's Christian Democrat parties. Europe's Christian Democrats are different to Conservatives in the UK or the US. They're a little bit closer to the centre and they're more willing to intervene into the economy in terms of wealth redistribution. The SND, ALDNR and EPP, they are the three groups that have pushed European integration historically. If you move further to the right from the EPP or further to the left from S&D, you tend to get more resistance to the European project. Although the Greens are typically pro-European, certainly on the right, the further away you get from the EPP, the more resistance you get from the, the parties towards the whole EU project. The ECR, this is basically a breakaway faction of the EPP that was founded by David Cameron and the Conservative Party who wanted a group for conservative parties that were less pro-European integration. The ENF, this was founded by Marine Le Pen and Geert Wilders. These parties are mostly national conservative. They're different to the EPP and ECR parties in that they talk a lot about immigration. They talk about defending national sovereignty and also national culture and national identity and national interests. That's what the national and national conservative stands for. The EPP, the ECR and the ENF are all essentially centre-right in that they're pro-business, they're not crazy about major intervention in the economy, and they're quite conservative on social issues. Ironically, Marine Le Pen's uh, Rassemblement National are probably a little bit of an outlier in that they have quite a few policies that are left of centre, but mostly the ENF parties are centre-right. The EFDD, there are two strands in this group, really. There's a, a hard Euroscepticism, 
The old UKIP under Nigel Farage was part of this group. They later left. Um, the Brexit Party is now part of this group. The AFD are also part of this group. The DD in the FDD stands for Direct Democracy. So this group advocates for referendums and more citizens' involvement in the democratic process. This is part of the AFD's platform. And this is one of the reasons why Italy's Five Star are part of this group. So let's look at the seat numbers. The first row are from 2014, the results from 2014. These are the numbers of seats that the groups had on the day of the election. They don't take into account subsequent changes. During the course of the five years, some MEPs switch parties or become independent. So these aren't the same totals that they ended up with on the last day of the parliament. The second row are the 2019 results. These are a little bit different from the official results. I am giving one extra seat to GUE stroke NGL. That's the German Animal Protection Party. They have one MEP. I think they'll join that group probably. I'm taking away three seats from the ECR. That's the Danish People's Party and two from the Finns Party because they're going to leave that group and join the ENF. I'm giving 15 more seats to the ENF because the AFD are going to join that group along with the Danish People's Party, the Finns Party and one MEP from the Conservative People's Party of Estonia. The ENF is essentially going to be replaced by the EAPN. That's Salvini's new group. This is essentially the ENF with a few extra parties. The EFDD, I'm giving them a lower total because I'm not counting the AFD in their number because the AFD are going to leave that group. So you can see the the GUE NGL lost a few seats. The Greens had a good night. They gained 19 seats. S&D, very bad night for them. ALDNR, good night for them. EPP, bad night for them. ECR, bad, not so bad as, as for the EPP. Very good night for the ENF. Okay, let's go through the groups one by one, starting with GUE stroke NGL. I'm not going to include every country in these lists. I'm only going to include the largest countries in Europe and some other countries that I've tried to cover on my channel. And I'm not going to include literally every party either. I'm only going to include relatively large parties, though I'll make some exceptions for some small parties that I think are interesting. The first row, the first column rather, on the left, those numbers are the 2014 seats. Then the next column are the 2019 seats. And then the, the plus or minus are the, the, the change in seat numbers. So France, the, the French Communist Party, La France Insoumise, that is um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon's party. They had a good night. They gained five seats. Germany's Die Linke. Linke means left in, in German. As I said, um, quite a few parties in this group use the word left in their name. Syriza, that's the ruling party in Greece. Ireland Sinn Féin may be a surprise to some people to find that party in this group. They're quite left-wing, maybe more left-wing than some people realise. Italy, the refounded um, Italian Communist Party. Netherlands, the Socialist Party. Spain, Unidas Podemos, Sweden, Left Party. And UK, Sinn Féin, of course, have a, a seat in Northern Ireland and they also have a seat in the Republic. Next, we have Greens, EFA. Good night for them. They gained a lot of seats, particularly in France and in Germany. The Green parties did very well. Also in the UK, overall a gain of, of 19 seats for Greens EFA. SND, a bad night for them, particularly in, in France. The Socialist Party lost seven seats. The SPD, the mainstream centre-left in Germany, lost 11 seats. The PD, the Partito Democratico in Italy, 12 seats lost for them. UK, Labour, they lost 10 seats, so 38 seats overall lost. Very bad night for the centre-left SND. Aldi and R, an overall gain of 38 seats, although most of that was centred in two countries, in France, where they gained 17 seats. Renaissance in France is an electoral alliance between Emmanuel Macron's La République en Marche and some smaller parties. La République en Marche did not run in 2014, so this was the first uh, European election in which they ran. And in the UK, the Liberal Democrats gained 15 seats. Although if you consider that the UK is possibly 
going to leave the European Union quite soon and you take away the Liberal Democrats' gains, the only really significant gain there were for Macron's party in France. So maybe not a, as, as, as good a night for Aldi as, as some people have suggested. The parties that are part of this group, FDP, that's the Free Democrats in Germany, the Freie Wähler, they're um, a small, loosely organised party in Bavaria. Ireland's Fianna Foyle, I have an asterisk beside their MEP because he did not sit with this group, he sat with the ECR. Ciudadanos in Spain, five seats gained for them, although how liberal that party is is, is really up for debate. They're probably more centre-right, they're certainly quite a strong nationalist, Spanish nationalist element to that party, which isn't typical for liberal parties, although they're also quite pro-feminism as well, which is something which you would associate very much with liberal liberal parties. So overall, a relatively good night for Aldi. EPP, the mainstream centre-right, the group for Christian Democrat parties, Austria, the um, Austrian People's Party, that's Sebastian Kurz's party, they gained two seats. France, Les Républicains, very bad night for them. Germany, CDU, that's Angela Merkel's party. CSU, they're the Bavarian sister party of the CDU, they lost five seats. Hungary, Fidesz, I have them highlighted in yellow because they've currently been suspended by the EPP for not matching the EPP's values when it comes to democracy and the rule of law and also for their anti-EU rhetoric. Ireland's um, Fine Gael are part of this group. Forza Italia, that's Silvio Berlusconi's party, they had a bad night. Partido Popular in Spain, four seats lost for them. Overall, a bad night for the EPP. ECR, this was the group founded by David Cameron and the Conservatives, although there's quite a few parties here who might be better described as National Conservative, maybe who would be a better fit in the um, the ENF. The LKR, those four seats are all MEPs who left the AFD. The AFD won six seats in the 2014 election, but since 2014, the AFD has moved further to the right and it's focused more on immigration. It was originally a party which is very much focused on the Euro bailouts, particularly for Greece. And over time, it's moved further to the right. And four of the original six MEPs left the party because of this and set up the LKR. So that's what the LKR is. Fratelli d'Italia, that's Georgia Maloney's party. They gained four seats. The FVD, the Forum for Democracy, Thierry Baudet's party gained three seats. It was overall quite a disappointing night for them. They had come first in the recent Senate stroke provincial elections with 14.5%. They came joint fourth this time around with 10.9%. So it was a slightly disappointing return for them. Law and Justice, that's the ruling party in Poland, a good night for them. Sweden Democrats picked up a seat, very bad night for the Conservatives. The UUP lost their seat in Northern Ireland as well. The ENF, this is the group that's going to be replaced by Salvini's new EAPN. The Danish People's Party, the Finns Party and the AFD, they're going to join the new EAPN. They weren't part of the original ENF. That's why I have their 2014 numbers in yellow. Vox I have included here as well. They haven't declared yet which group they're going to join in, but they they would probably be um, a good fit either for this group or for the ECR. We have Austria's FPO, the Freedom Party. They lost one seat, which isn't too bad considering the crisis that they've been involved in. There was a scandal recently where their leader, H.C. Straka, was caught on camera apparently offering government contracts in return for pro- positive um, press coverage. The footage in question was recorded in Ibiza in the summer of 2017. A woman was posing as the niece of a Russian oligarch who was interested in buying a newspaper. And this footage was released um, a couple of weeks ago. It was released to a couple of media outlets in Germany. It's caused a, a big scandal. It's in Austria. The government has collapsed over it. There's a lot of question marks over this. It's still not clear who was originally behind this. It's It required quite an elaborate um 
amount of organization in terms of time and money. We don't know who was ultimately behind this, what their motivation was or why this was only released now. FPO got 17.2% in the European election compared to 205 in the 2017 Austrian general election. So not a terrible night for them considering the problems that they faced recently. Vlaams Belang in Flanders picked up two seats. SPD, that's um, Tomio Okamura's party in the Czech Republic, picked up two seats. Danish People's Party, Rassemblement National, that's Marine Le Pen's party. A good night for them. They won the most seats in France, although I wouldn't read too much into that. They have got numbers like that in European elections in France before. They've never been able to replicate that in elections for France's parliament, which those elections for France's parliament typically have a higher turnout and you need more candidates and a stronger grassroots organisation and Le Pen has never been able to do as well in those elections as she has in the European elections. Also in terms of the presidential elections, although she typically does quite well in the first round, it's difficult for her to move much beyond that core support of 20-25%. AFD picked up five seats in Germany. Lega, a really extraordinary night for them. Unlike Le Pen and the Rassemblement National, I think Lega's result in Italy really is significant. This is a, a party led by Salvini, who is a brilliant politician, great user of social media. The party itself is very well organized, very strong grassroots organization. And I think this is a party that is very much for real. I think it's the most extraordinary story in Europe in recent years. This is a party that until recently, was not just a northern party, but was a northern separatist party. And the idea that people in the south of Italy would be voting for this party in large numbers, which they are now, if you had told someone that 10 years ago, they wouldn't have believed you. Yet here we are with Lega, they're the biggest party in Italy, they won the most seats, they got 34% of the vote, it really is extraordinary. In the Netherlands, PVV, that's Geert Wilders, party. They lost all four of their their seats. I think this is a party which is facing uh, possibly an uncertain future with the rise of the FVD, which is Thierry Baudet's party, which pursues a similar national conservative line, but which appears to have the momentum and it appears to be winning over maybe some of the PVV's voters, some of their base. I mean, is is there a long-term future for both of these parties in Dutch politics? I'm not sure that there is. I think my money would be on the FVD to be the, the better long-term bet in the Netherlands. UKIP, um, UKIP were originally part of the EFDD. They, in 2014, they won 24 seats. But during the course of this parliament, during the course of this five years, all but four of those MEPs left as UKIP has moved further to the right under Batten. All but four of those MEPs left. One of the four, Janice Atkinson, was expelled from the party. So really there's only three that stayed with UKIP. Two of them sit as part of the ENF group and one of them is an independent. EFDD, this is a group which is really facing an uncertain future. And in order to qualify as a group, you need... MEPs from seven different countries at least and you need 25 MEPs in total. I think they're going to find it really difficult to to meet that criteria. France, Debout la France, that's Nicolas Dupont-Agnon's party. They're all, they're both ex, um, Front National MEPs who left and joined Debout la France, but they're both gone now. The AFD are going to leave this group. Italy's Five Star are not happy in this group. They've tried to leave. They tried to join Aldi, but they were rejected. UKIP, um, UKIP are gone. Brexit Party, Nigel Farage, there, there's talks between them and the EAPN, so it's possible that they may leave as well. I think it's, it's difficult to see how this group is going to survive. The non inscrits these are MEPs that are not attached to any group. And the phrase non-attached is sometimes used. non inscrits is French. A lot of the MEPs here are from far-right parties. And not far-right as in populist, that the way the term is often used to describe national conservative parties. And these parties really are far-right. You've NPD from Germany, that was Udo Voigt. He won a seat in 2014, though we, the NPD lost their seat this time around. Golden Dawn from Greece, Jobbik from Hungary. 
Junts per Catalunya, that's Carlos Puigdemont's party. He was the leader of the Catalan regional government that declared independence. He's now been elected as a, an MEP. The DUP are also here. They're not part of any group. Okay, let's talk now about the Spitzen candidate process for president of the European Commission. The president of the European Commission used to be selected by the European Council. That's the European Council are the heads of government. They used to pick the president of the commission and then he was approved in a vote by the European Parliament. Now in 2014 that all changed. The European parties in the Parliament said that we should not just have the opportunity to vote yes or no on who the European Council chooses. In fact we should choose who the president of the commission is. So they started to run lead candidates in the European elections. That's what Spitzenkandidat means. So the, the European parties ran these lead candidates essentially saying this is the person who we think should be president of the commission and if we win the most seats in the parliament we think this person should be the first choice as president of the commission. Now this was quite controversial. Not all the groups in the parliament agreed with this. Certainly the national governments weren't crazy about this idea but in the end they consented to this and Jean-Claude Juncker who was the Spitzenkandidat of the EPP which finished first in terms of number of seats he did in the end become the president of the commission. Before we go further on I think we need to clarify how things work in the European Parliament in terms of parties and groups and what the differences are. So in the European Parliament we have three tiers. We have national political parties like the Conservatives in the UK or the AFD in Germany and then they organise themselves into European political parties and then the European political parties organise themselves into European political groups. It's groups that I've been talking about so far, the EPP and the ENF and the ECR, they're all groups. Now, if you think this is going to start to get complicated, it really isn't because most of the groups are dominated by a single European political party. And in those groups, sometimes the, the party even has either a very similar name to the group or in some cases it has exactly the same name as the group. The SND, for example, only have one party, the PES Aldi have two parties, one which has the same name and the, also the European Democratic Party, but the Aldi party is very is much the, the larger of the two. The EPP only has one party which has exactly the same name as the group. ECR has two, it has the Alliance of Conservatives and Reformists in Europe. So you can see the similar name and a similar logo. There's also a smaller party called the European Christian Political Movement, but ACRE is very much the larger of the two. ENF only has one constituent party, which again you can see a similar name and a similar logo. EFDD doesn't even have a constituent party. The only groups where this distinction between party and group is important is in GUE and GL, where there are four constituent parties, although only the party of the European left is recognised by the EU as an official party. And in particular, the Greens EFA, you have three quite distinct parties making up that group. You have the, the European Green Party representing the various Green parties, the European Free Alliance representing the regional separatist parties, and then you have the European Pirate Party representing the various pirate parties. So this really isn't something you need to worry too much about. The names of the, the groups are much more important than the names of the parties. The reason I'm bringing this up is that when it comes to the Spitzenkandidat process, that's based on the European parties, this, that second tier. It's not based on the groups. And the reason for that is that you're not supposed to campaign using the name and the logo of your group. You're only supposed to campaign using the names of your party. So it's it's, it's largely a, a, an academic distinction. It doesn't really make a, a tremendous amount of difference, but it is important to know that that is how it works. So look at the seat total numbers for SND and EPP in 2014. Now I know these are the group totals, but the party seat totals would be quite similar. You can see that SND and EPP, they're so far ahead of the other groups that if the parliament was to adopt this policy that the, the party that finishes first in terms of seat 
total numbers that their Spitzenkandidat should be the first choice for president of the commission. You can see that the winner would be SND and EPP every time. Also, look at their combined total. It's over 400, which is more than a majority. This means that they they didn't really need the support of other groups in the parliament in order for them to agree on who the president of the commission should be. Now, look at the seat total numbers from 2019. They no longer have a majority. The SND and the EPP no longer have a majority. Now, this is significant because it means that they're going to need the support of at least one one other group, probably Aldi, in order to reach agreement on who the president of the commission is going to be. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the language coming out of the parties now is no longer that the party with the, the biggest number of seats, that their Spitzenkandidat should be the first choice for president of the commission. What they're now saying is that the president of the commission should just be one of the lead candidates. It should be someone who campaigned during the election as a lead candidate of one of the groups who was presented to voters and who was given an opportunity to take part in debates, etc. The SND's Spitzenkandidat, or rather the PES, because of course he represented the PES party. Their Spitzenkandidat was Franz Timmermans, who is Dutch. The EPP's Spitzenkandidat was Manfred Weber, who is German. He's from the CSU, which is the sister party of Angela Merkel's CDU. So these were the two heavyweights during the um, the European election. The EPP finished first, so normally you would expect Manfred Weber to be the, the likely candidate the likely next president of the commission. But as I said, because those two groups have lost their majority, things are starting to get a little bit more complicated. Emmanuel Macron is not a fan of this Spitzenkandidat process. Uh, he is not also not a fan of Manfred Weber. He feels that he's not experienced enough. And this is one of the reasons why Margrethe Vestager is starting to emerge as a a, a real candidate for the next president of the commission. She is the former commissioner for competition. She made her name taking on American tech giants. Macron would much prefer her. And the fact that um, SND and EPP are probably going to need the support of Aldi, this is another reason why she may be, um, she may end up being a likely choice. Angela Merkel, as the, the head of government of Germany, she's the, all, along with Macron, they're the two most important voices in the European Council. Merkel does want Weber. Of course, he's German. He's, he's from the CSU, which is the CDU's sister party. So there is a bit of a disagreement there. Another uh, option that's come up is Michel Barnier. Now, he did not run as a lead candidate in the election. This is obviously a problem. It's going to undermine the whole Spitzenkandidat idea if he's picked. But one advantage of Barnier is that he's from the EPP. So this may placate them if their Spitzenkandidat Weber is not chosen. So at the moment, those four Franz Timmermans is still in the running because Macron um, Macron supports him. He's he Macron would prefer Timmerman to Weber. So Timmermans, Vestager, Weber, and Barnier, all four of them. It's quite a, an even four horse race at the moment in terms of the the betting markets. Manfred Weber is is the favourite, but not by much. I mean, realistically, the president of the Commission could be any of those four. The timetable for all this, there's a European Council meeting on the 20th and the 21st of June. Between now and then, there's going to be a lot of talks between the Council, the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, and the groups in the Parliament, and they'll probably reach agreement on who the, the President of the Commission should be. And that will probably, the European Council will probably announce their choice on the 20th or the 21st of June. There'll then be a vote in the European Parliament, probably either the 2nd, 3rd, 4th of July, or maybe the 16th, 17th, 18th of July. Once the president of the commission is confirmed, he or she will then get to work on arranging the composition of the commission itself, and then the commission as a whole will then face a vote of approval in the European Parliament in October or November. So that is more or less the story of the European elections. I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for watching and until next time.